then, you know, mute them, remove. Just, just be sure. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, special meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee on Comprehensive Job Creation Plan. Uh, I'm Paul Krikorian, Chair of the Committee. I'm joined by my colleague, Councilmember Bob Blumenfield, and Councilmember Harris Austin will be joining us uh, momentarily. Um, so uh, today is May 29th. 2020, and we have three items on today's agenda. Uh, we'll be taking public comment on each of those three items before we uh, take any items up. There will be no general public comment uh, because uh, this is a special meeting, so uh, comment will be limited to the items that are on the agenda today. Uh, and I would ask that all speakers um, be mindful of that uh, because uh, commenting on items not on the agenda today will be considered uh, to be disruptive and uh, will not be permitted. So um, with that, anybody wishing to offer comment uh, on the items listed on the agenda can call 669-900-6833. Again, that's 669-900-6833. 6833 and use meeting ID number 9870899417 pound again that's 9870899417 pound you'll then need to press pound again when you're prompted for uh, participant ID. So with that, uh, we are ready to begin public comment. And uh, we'll go, and by the way, uh, Mr. Blumenfield, we will likely take item number three uh, up first uh, and then return back to item numbers one and two, but we'll be taking public comment on all items uh, on the agenda before we take up any items. So. Uh, you'll have one minute per item, and uh, if you'd like to speak on multiple items, you'll be limited to two minutes total. Mr. Chair, would you like me to call the roll uh, to get the attendance of the committee members? Yes, let's go ahead. Thank you. Let's, uh, thank you for the reminder. Let's go ahead and do that and establish a quorum. Yeah, Council Member Paul Krikorian? Here. Council Member Bla Bob Blumenfield? Present. Council Member Marquise Harris Dawson? I guess we have two uh, committee members present, Mr. Chair. And that is a quorum, so we will uh, go ahead and begin with our public comment now. Please state your name and what item you would like to speak on. Speaker? Speaker, are you there? I'm here. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Mark Morales from City National Bank, and I'd like to speak on item number three, um, and that is the regional procurement system. 99.2% um, of uh, California businesses are small businesses. However, they make up only less than 20% of all city spending. A regional procurement system would allow those businesses to find out about opportunities prior to them being uh, awarded to these larger companies and allow them to participate in the 
in the supply chain for uh, city and for private enterprise. Um, we see with the California Public Utility Commission Supplier Clearinghouse that having a centralized location um, can provide up to 43% of uh, small and diverse owned businesses getting contracts with the utility industry, and uh, City National fully supports being able to do this for the Los Angeles region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Good morning, and thank you, Council Members Krikorian, Blumenfield, and Herstassen for your leadership and diligence to open opportunities for small businesses to participate in regional procurement and contracting. My name is Sonia Blake. I'm President and CEO of the Valley Economic Alliance. This is such an important issue for the Valley's small businesses. Many of the region's manufacturing, construction, and technology businesses are based in the San Fernando Valley. They are significantly hampered by the current system, and we desperately need to modernize, clarify, and improve it now. Currently, small businesses that have scarce time and resources would need to register in dozens of separate databases to be considered for work in the region. Secondly, the, system, the city's procurement platform, LA Bavin, has become unwieldy and can be difficult to navigate. And thirdly, too few businesses are getting the word out about these opportunities. The Alliance is very much in favor of an upgrade of Bavin, creating a regional platform so that businesses can learn about region-wide opportunities with one registration and conducting extensive outreach to make sure the process is more inclusive. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Mary Les, item three. Please state your name for the record. Good morning. Good morning, Council uh, Member Kirkorian and your committee. This is Mary Leslie, President of the Los Angeles Business Council. And on behalf of over 500 members, I want to express our strong support for ITA's budget request to transform the city's procurement system. Over the last three years, the LABC Institute began an initiative, Compete for LA, to see how the LA region could replicate a model employed for the 2012 London Olympics to open up contract opportunities for small businesses by developing a regional clearinghouse of procurement opportunities and suppliers. That model successfully created a database of over 200,000 businesses and awarded 14,000 contracts to small and medium-sized businesses for the Olympics. The budget request in front of you today will allow ITA to create a platform that can replicate this success by developing a modern regional system open to both public and private opportunities that can leverage a decade's worth of sports and entertainment events leading up to the 2028 Olympics. This system will help the city and the region build an expansive database of local, small, and diverse businesses that can help the city achieve its local higher minority spend goals. We want to thank Councilman Krikorian for his leadership, Ted Ross and his team at ITA, and the CPO, Sharon Hobbs, for all of their leadership. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Please state your Morning. name for the record and what items you'd like to speak on. Good morning. I'm Michael Shillstone with Central City Association. I'd like to speak on item three. Go right ahead. We're strongly supportive of upgrading the city's regional procurement portal to provide greater opportunities for small, minority-owned, and disadvantaged businesses to compete for bids in L.A. Despite our current circumstances, Los Angeles is still poised for tremendous public investment and will host many major events leading up to the 2028 Olympics. Our public and private leaders have the chance to ensure that the benefits of these considerable investments reach LA small businesses, which are the backbone of our economy. It's more important than ever to support our small and disadvantaged businesses. We look forward to the system upgrade moving ahead and encourage that there be a concerted outreach and marketing effort to engage businesses who have been traditionally deterred by the procurement process, as well as prime contractors. Thanks so much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Please state your name for the record and what items you'd like to speak on. Good morning, my name is Jennifer Ito, and I'm the research director with USC Program for Environmental Regional Equity, and I would like to speak to item three. Good morning. Good morning. I just want to express. I, good morning. I just want to express my support for today's budget request to update the city's procurement system. 
last year, in November of 2019, we released a study to inform how small businesses and businesses owned by women and people of color in Los Angeles can better access economic opportunities stemming from the different preparations for major events leading up to and including the 2028 Olympics. And we found that, in fact, an updated and centralized procurement system that allows for both the public and private sector to post opportunities is needed, especially for these businesses that don't have the capacity to navigate several portals. So we believe that such a system paired with targeted outreach and capacity building support can help not only drive economic growth and recovery in Los Angeles, but can drive towards more equitable growth. So I want to thank the committee in advance for your leadership on this issue. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Please state your name for the record and what items you'd like to speak on. My name is Eric Previn, and I'd like to speak on item number three. All right. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Previn. Thank you, Mr. Krikorian. Uh You know, this is this is a very important area, the idea of procurements, and the great idea to build the ramp to be more accessible for small businesses to get involved in some of the bigger initiatives that we have, like the Olympics and the Paralympics. But the, the wrinkle is that we've been doing a medium to terrible job up until now by feeding a series of paneled, impaneled uh, entities that work cooperatively with the city. And, you know, it, it really has been devastating across a lot of different sectors. So I look forward to a transparent process. I also note that we are having a budget <clears throat> coming up, and it's very important that we, in addition to uh, having private sessions with the LABC, the Business Council, it's nice, we should also have public hearings. And as you know, uh, I know that there's flux because of the COVID situation, but every uh, department should make a presentation, and the public should be given a chance to give a comment, and the members of the committee should be given a chance to give a comment. And that's 40 items, not one item for the budget. So I look forward to uh, a reasonable take on procurements and also on thank the budget hearing coming up. So thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Speaker. Please state your name for the record and what items you'd like to speak on. Hello? Go ahead, speaker. Hi, good morning. Uh, Gene Hale here with the um, Greater LA African American Chamber. Uh, just want good morning, to speak Gene. In support of, how's everyone? Uh, just want to speak in support good. of the uh, proposed um, proposal that we're talking about. I think that um, this would uh, surely um, bring LA up to par with the other municipalities across the country in terms of uh, procurement systems. And also, I think it would be a great opportunity to um, reach out to the uh, community uh, to uh, stimulate that community economically through uh, more uh, procurements with the city. So uh, the chamber really supports this, and we hope that uh, going forward the uh, council will as well. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much, sir. Uh, appreciate your, your support very much. Thank you. All right. Do we is that the last speaker or do we have anyone else on the queue? I see no one else on the queue at this time. Okay, terrific. Uh then we will go ahead and uh proceed to item number three. Good morning, members. Clay McCarter, CLA's office. Item three, Chief Procurement Officer, Information Technology Agency report relative to the Compete for LA proposal. Very good. And we'll be uh, hearing this report from uh, our Chief Procurement Officer, Shannon Hoppus, and Ted Ross, the General Manager of ITA. So I'd like to invite them to, uh, to the microphone, if you will, to present. Okay, we're ready. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and Honorable Members. My name is Shannon Hoppus, and I'm the Chief Procurement Officer with the Mayor's Office of Budget and Innovation. Um, I'm also joined by Jessica Lopez of my team and, as you mentioned, um, our ITA General Manager, Mr. Ted Ross. 
We also have present here a uh, city attorney in the audience if there's any uh, additional questions. Before I begin, I would like to first start by saying that this project has been a true labor of love for all involved, uh, both internally and externally. It's been a heavy lift from all because of what it delivers to our business community and the role it will play in assisting with our economic recovery. This has been a combined effort with your offices, the mayor's office, ITA, Bureau of Contract Administration, Board of Public Works, City Attorney, our proprietary departments, the Innovation Performance Commission, and the Economic and Workforce Development Department. And we've leaned on strong partnerships that include the LA Business Council and the Los Angeles Coalition for the Economy and Jobs. We realize this is just the beginning and the true success of this platform will be the cooperative cl collaboration of government, business leadership groups, and the private sector to band together to ensure the continued success and economic prosperity of Los Angeles. This will, of course, include working groups made up of the business community in assisting us in the direction and development of the new platform. I want to thank the respondents of the RFI for taking the time and sharing their insights. We know there was much thought and effort that went into their responses. I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to specifically call out Julia Gould of your office to thank her for all of her hard work, her tenacity, her relentlessness, her patience and kindness. Her sincere interest in this effort has played a large part in getting us here today. So thank you, Julia. You'll be missed by all of us and we wish you the very best in your exciting new journey. So now I will be providing a brief background on this effort, how we got here, some of the recommendations to your committee, and then I'll ask Jessica to speak to the RFI um, and ITA to speak to the technical piece of this report. Uh, briefly, on January 23rd of 2019, um, a motion was introduced to review the LABC's Small Business Feasibility Study, and that was relative to Compete for LA, which was a procurement portal that, that would aggregate the contracting opportunities from across the region, from both public and private sector. Pursuant to that motion, the CLA prepared a report and analyzed and assessed the proposal. And last October, your committee heard that report and asked our collective departments to, re to report back on the feasibility and funding needs to provide regional in-house contracting software that would allow this level of participation um, on, a re again, a regional um, basis from both public and private sector contractors. Uh, you asked us to issue an RFI and report with the results of that RFI and work with other government agencies and private contractors to assess their interest in participating in and jointly funding a regional procurement organization. The report before you contains the information requested and makes recommendations to your committee to approve the licensing for ITA to do the work necessary to expand on the city's solicitation platform into a regional procurement portal and to identify funding for a contract with an external organization to do small business outreach and engagement. So unless there are any questions at this time, I'll hand it over to Jessica to give you a brief overview of the responses to the RFI. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions from members at this point? Uh, some questions, but I can wait till the end of the presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, uh, so go right ahead, Ms. Hoppus. So, Jessica? Yeah. Thank you, Shannon. Good morning, honorable members of the committee. My name is Jessica Lopez. I am the clear contracting analyst for the Chief Procurement Officer. I am here to report on the results requested by this committee to issue a request for information for regional procurement. The city released an RFI on February 21st. 2020 with a May 1st, 2020 deadline to ascertain the capabilities and capacity from any and all interested entities to help inform the city's approach to a regional contract and procurement outreach program with the following objectives. The first one, objective one, requested information for a small business participation and engagement component. Objective two, request information for a regional digital platform component. And objective three was labeled other in order to give the public an opportunity to submit information to any other approach 
with the intention to support a regional coordinator contacting and procurement strategy and not meeting. The type of responses received by the deadline May 1st at 7 p.m. was as follows. The city received 15 responses in total, 13 of whom were being responsive and two unresponsive. Human time attachment meeting contains the unified responses. Of the responses received, three respondents solely submitted to objective one, one respondent solely submitted to objective two, and, and eight respondents submitted for both objective one and two. And finally, one respondent submitted to objective three, which again was the other label. And as stated in the report, we give a summary of the types of responses we receive and the respective estimated cost ranges. And at this time, um, I will hand it over back to Shannon. Oh, actually. Oh, actually <laughs> yes, actually, I will hand it back over to um, the general manager of ITA to speak to the technology component. Thank you. Thank Excellent. you very much. Mr. Ross, welcome. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Shannon. Honorable members, uh, the Information Technology Agency was requested to research and join the, the working group to research the feasibility and the funding needs to provide a regional in-house contracting software. Uh, as we examined it and based on our research, we were really looking for a platform that could perform the functions that would be number one comprehensive. It needed to have a high volume of high quality bid opportunities made available to the region. Uh, it also needed to be comprehensive in that all certifications were fully digital and accessible. Number two, it needed to be easy to use. Uh, we felt it was extremely important and we heard some of the comments that were provided in public comment. This needs to be easy to use and easy accessible, not just for big businesses and medium sized businesses, but that even smaller businesses can fully engage with it and fully compete. And number three, it had to be secure. We wanna make sure that we're providing a secure portal for our valued digital assets and our valued partners. Now, LA Bavin has been the city's current procurement and solicitation system for the last 17 years. It's been a one-stop shop. Over 56,000 companies are registered Bavin. They search for all the city's bid opportunities. They register as maybe we be veteran, local owned businesses, disabled owned, et cetera. And they also use it to have prime contractors connect with their subs. Bavin's been performing a lot of the actions and the requirements for a regional procurement system, but performing it for the city of Los Angeles. Um, however, the Bavin of today cannot perform the requirements of what's being asked for. It was built back in 2003. It was built on the best technology at the time, uh, but of course, substantial additions and modifications have been required, and, the re and it's yet to be replatformed since 2003. Uh, it cannot accommodate some of the features and capabilities that we were identified uh, during the, the working group. And so we started to identify what would be the alternatives. So working with the mayor's chief procurement officer, city attorney, and others, we examined some of the responses from the RFI. And based on the discussion, based on the research, our proposal is to go ahead and replace the current LA Babin platform with a modern customer relationship management software we happen to have current contracts in place. We did a proof of concept to even examine based on the requirements of the software. And we identified that a Salesforce platform would handle not only the existing requirements of the Babin platform, but the additional features and functions that are being requested for a regional platform. And based on all of our analysis and all of our initial usage, it would very clearly be a comprehensive system. It would be an easy to use system and it would be a very secure system. Uh, based on our estimates and availability of funding, we expect under optimal circumstances that we could do of the full replacement between six and eight months upon receipt of funding. Um, this is actually a very aggressive and fast time frame that we can perform because of the existing experience and the existing capabilities of the Bavin system. Uh, what we would do is we would roll that out. It would be it include the ability to publish bid opportunities. It would include the prime to sub outreach that was mentioned before. Uh, it would also include enhanced certifications. And then additional features that they get identified by our business community and by our procurement officer, uh, we would be able to institute them also. The annual cost of the licenses is, as mentioned in the report, $996,286. Uh, $996, um, this actually represents a 55% discount, aggressively negotiated to get to this. 
And what it does is it provides all the licenses for both the internal city users as well as the bids of those who will be submitting and publishing their bids. Um, the, as you'll notice in the cost, really the, the large bulk of it is simply the software licensing itself. The IT also requires unfreezing the authority for three positions to simply allow us the appropriate staffing to do the development. Um, I now stand open for any additional questions related to this, and it's been a pleasure to work on such an important project that's important to our business community. Thank you very much, Mr. Ross. Appreciate it. Um, is there anybody else who uh, needed to speak before we go to questions? If not, uh, we'll go first to Mr. Blumenfield. Great. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, thank you very much for, for spearheading this and working on this. I think this is really important, and I want to also give a big shout out to the LA Business Council um, working with you on this. Uh, it's just it's so important that we we figure out ways to really bring in businesses, and we've talked about this before. Uh, just a couple of questions, and then I, I have one concern, um, which I, I think we can figure out. But uh, uh, on the question side, one is, does the fiscal crisis and the proposed hiring freeze affect the implementation of this? And I don't know who in the group would answer that question, but, but how does that play into this? I think, go ahead. Uh, I, I just Ted Roth, <laughs> uh, general manager of ITA. Uh, I'd say on, on one element, yes. So uh, there's been funding sources identified in the report. So we've been working with various entities to identify how this gets funded. Um, and so we have some initial proposed funding sources to make this happen. Of course, this is also an annual cost. This is around $996,000 that are annual licenses to simply subscribe for the software. As you can see, the labor side, which is usually the most expensive part of a project, is, is being included with city staffing. Some of our best staff were able to perform this function. The request we have is the unfreeze. So in a nutshell, this is a tough financial situation. There is some initial funding sources identified. There would need to be ongoing sources of funding, as well as we are impacted by a freeze condition, and there are three positions that we are including the recommendations for an unfreeze. And I defer to Shannon if she has anything else to add to that. Yes, it, it's all been impacted, but this was, again, a heavy lift from everyone trying to come together on this. Um, but we did recommend a fee study be conducted, um, so it does provide the ongoing support necessary to keep the platform up to date. Um, the fee study would only uh, require, you know, both, most basic fees. Uh, to um, cover licensing and, and staffing. Um, and again, our, our team would work together to conduct that and see what that would look like. So the hiring freeze is not going to be an impediment? The, for, for, from ITA's perspective, there are three positions that we request unfreeze, but that's the impediment specifically related to this project. Okay. Now, one possible solution for some of this is you know, the report notes that it's a critical economic recovery tool. And I agree. Um, it is a recovery tool for, during this uh, COVID crisis. So can the timing of this allow us to categorize the costs of developing this tool, at least in part, as a COVID-related exp expense and allow us to potentially tap into the, um, the $700 million of federal fund relief fund or, or the FEMA money? Has anybody looked at that? Because I see it as, uh, as I mean, I know we were working on it before COVID ever started, but it certainly is a recovery tool, and that certainly is what FEMA money is about. Well, we're definitely having those discussions and um, seeing what the appetite is, but we we believe the same that it it may may qualify. We we don't know as of yet, but we're gonna continue to pursue well, those who, options. Whose appetite? Because my appetite, oh. I'm very <laughs> uh, but, but it's a serious question, though. I mean, who, right. are we talking about, you know, the feds and, you know, Trump not approving it, or are we talking about the internal city appetite for, for adding this into our COVID response? I believe it's all of the above. Okay. Well, I, I think we need to make Mr. Chair, a recommendation in this that uh, 
first and foremost, we put this forward as a COVID response funding item uh, because I think we can, you know, we can test the waters on it. And certainly, it would make more sense. And it and that goes to my concern, which is some of the money, a very small amount of it, well, that's that small, is coming from the IPC, from the Innovation Committee. And uh, I'm very reluctant to spend the IPC money without going through the process. I chair the committee that, you know, would help create the IPC. It comes through my committee. They, I've turned back a lot of proposals that folks have used to try to just tap that money directly without going through the process of going through the uh, IPC commission and then coming to my committee and we weigh it against all the other things that are in the innovation fund. Now, I love this. Don't get me wrong. For me, this would make a lot of sense. But even though I chair the committee, I, I'm reluctant to just make that decision unilaterally or have, have that decision made outside of the process of the IPC when we've turned away every other attempt to do this exact thing, which is to tap directly into the IPC uh, and not let it go through the process that we've committed and all of the folks who are painstakingly working on that. So, Mr. Chair, I'd like to, to, to find a different way to fund that portion and perhaps at the very least, you know, we could get some money out of the COVID response that could cover the IPC so we don't have to basically uh, undo what the IPC is. So, Mr. Bloomingfield, I share all of your concerns uh, and thoughts. Um, this has been uh, a laborious effort uh, to try to identify in a, in a budget that is already, um, as you know, this year um, in a uh, state of significant distress uh, to identify available funding sources to, to get us off the ground. Um, but I also agree with you fully that if ever there was an expenditure that was appropriate to our uh, rapid economic recovery from the COVID-19 crisis, this is it. And so uh, one thing I would suggest, there's going to be a number of amendments uh, that the CLA will be reading momentarily, but um, I would request that we also uh, ask for an instruction uh, to the CAO to seek reimbursement of all expenses all first year expenses at least related uh, to uh, this program from uh, available CARES Act or other federal funding sources related to the COVID-19 crisis. So I, I think that's, a, that's an excellent recommendation. Um, if, if we do not get that reimbursement, we don't have an immediately available alternative source uh, of funding other than the ones that are set forth before us today. Um, my staff and I think a lot of the other city uh, staff involved in this just kind of tried to scrub every potential uh, uh, source of loose change under the cushions to try to come up with this. Um, so I, I think if we were to make that change now, there would be a gap um, that we would have to make up from some other source. And um, so I'm, I'm hesitant to do that at this point, but and we can certainly have that dialogue about uh, reimbursement uh, between now and the time that we implement this as well. Yeah, I, I just I don't like the precedent of taking the IPC fund. Um, as I said, you know, and I, and, and it's because I'm particularly close. I, I work with the commission. I see them working hard to, to figure out the innovations. So, um, you know, I, 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 I can't be part of just taking their, their funds. Maybe we can have this good. now, but I do think this is in a very innovative concept that may qualify under that. So maybe there's a way we could send this to the IPC commission to have them come to my committee and, and recommend this this funding, um, and and try to get the funds that way as as it's an emergency situation. I do think they probably would would recognize the innovation that's here, but uh, I just I don't like the idea of just yanking. Um, you know, yanking the rug out from under them. And um, as I said, I've, I've had to turn this back because this has been tried numerous times by other efforts because everybody looks at that at the innovation fund and says, oh, I, what I'm doing is innovative, so I'm going to just take that money. But that, that subverts the whole process and, and all the people that are involved in that process. 
So I can I can assure you that I don't think there's been a fiscal year uh, that I've been budget chair where I haven't had a general manager and sometimes many general managers come to my office and say, well, we asked for this to be in our budget. The mayor didn't put it in the budget. So we were thinking maybe we could use the innovation fund to fund this, whether it's innovative or not. Right. So share, I share your concern about that. Um, the funding that is um, uh, before us today from the innovation fund is uh, money that has is left in that fund for this year. There will not be additional appropriations uh, by uh, the committee this um, in this fiscal year. So that's why um, I felt a little bit safer in being able to uh, utilize that money because it's not going to be, it, it cannot realistically be used for anything else between now and the end of the fiscal year just because they're not going to meet and that the money hasn't been appropriated for anything else uh, at this point. Does this money get swept or is sure. this I share your concern, but I, I don't have a solution that isn't going to result in a $168,000 uh, shortfall in this. So, um, Would this money get swept at the end of the year or is this, um, does this get rolled into the, I guess we usually take whatever's there and we, we bake it into the next year appropriation. I think that would normally be our practice. I don't know that that would be guaranteed uh, in a situation like this, where we're looking at significant shortfalls next year. Although, actually, isn't there, there's probably an answer to it. What did the mayor's budget do on that? Uh, I'm not expecting you to know off the top of your head, but maybe the staff knows. Uh, did that money get swept, or did it, in his proposed budget, which will go into effect on June 1st, that is a good question. Does it? Because if it gets, if it's going to get swept otherwise, then I can, I, I, I'm much more easily willing to part with it in that respect. But if it's baked into their next year funding, then um, I have a bigger problem with it. But that's an answer we could probably get a quick answer to. It's a knowable answer. Um, I can have more stuff yes, we, we, yeah, and we can certainly follow up with the budget team. Um, all I had done was um, talk to the commission to find out that they actually did receive funding for next fiscal year, but the conversation did not include whether or not it rolled over this year's funds into the next. So um, I, I didn't have all of the information to, to know that. If, if for the record it, it matters, we, we were actually submitting a proposal to IPC for some of these components in the replatforming. So to your point, um, we can certainly follow through with that application and, and actually submit it. We did hope to, to have it heard before the commission and we can certainly follow through with that. Well, I mean, it goes to the commission and then it goes to my committee and we, mm -hmm. you know, we don't approve everything. We, this right. is something I, I, I've been very open about how much I support it, but, um, you know, but just process-wise, uh, I'm trying to figure out if there is, uh, maybe, Mr. Chair, while we're figuring that answer out, we could go on to the other item and then come back to this. And Because uh, if it's being swept anyway and, the, and it's not, because if we're taking it and it's baked into next year's budget, then we're essentially taking their funding from next year without going through the process. And that makes me uncomfortable. Um, and if it's being swept anyway and their funding is baked into next year's budget, then then I'm okay with it. But I'd like to know the answer before voting on it. Okay. My team will connect with the budget team and see what information they can get. Okay. All right. Uh, anything else, Mr. Blumenfield, on this item? Um, just, a, just a comment. I mean, you know, as I said, I think this is a fantastic way for our small, local small businesses on the front end for government procurement and it's, uh, I mean, on, on the, on the front end, but I guess it just reminds me and I have to make the comment on the back end, we have a big problem as well. And this isn't going to cure it, but, uh, I'm just reminded of it every time I'm dealing with small business and nonprofits, the city doesn't pay in an expeditious manner. I was just talking to uh, the conservation Corps about some bills that they have from almost a year ago. Uh, and I hear from 
uh, other small businesses who say, we're just not, we, we won't apply for the city. We can get through the process, but we can't float the city money for a year. It's just not, and it's just not right uh, for us to be asking small businesses to float their payment for a year or, or more. And so as, as business friendly and local business, as we make this front end, which is wonderful that we need to do it, we really undercut all the good work that we're about to do if we can't solve the back end and actually get people paid in a timely manner. And uh, I, I put that out there just because it's part and parcel of the, the problem that we're solving. Uh, it is, it, but it in no way detracts from the fact that we also have to work on the front end, which is this, and I'm 100% uh, for what we're doing here. But I just, I just have to mention that every time this comes up because it just it kills me that we are, we're, we're pushing away small businesses because we can't get our act together to pay folks in a timely manner. And I don't know if there's any response to that, but, but that's just the, the comment. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. And um, I think that one of the, as you know, the council uh, within the COVID-19 crisis instructed that all accounts payable be paid uh, to small local businesses within 15 days of submission. That's pretty aggressive, I, I understand, but it, in an emergency like this, it's particularly important. But it's important at all the time for just the very reason you, you said. Uh, you know, big corporation can can carry those payables, but, um, but a small business just can't. Any other uh, comments or staff on that? If I may speak to that, that, that is of great importance to our team and that is part of what we are, are looking at. It's, it's really a holistic um, approach to this, technology only being one piece of um, the barriers. So we have to look at policy process and, and that really what is, is what our team is tasked to do. Um, it is a little um, more difficult when you have um, the payments, such, especially for the service side, being uh, dispersed among 40 different departments. So now you have to kind of look individually, like what are the problems internally and really um, work, again, holistically to resolve those. And um, that's, that's definitely part of what we're doing because there's no point in bringing everybody to the city if we're not going to pay them in a timely manner. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Harris Dawson. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the staff uh, for their work on this issue. Uh, I want to, um, you know, associate myself with the comments of Mr. Blumenfeld. Uh, for a couple reasons. One, um, the process is always important, as frustrating as it can be sometimes, especially when we feel the kind of pressure that we all feel now. Uh, it's easy to, to skip processes, but I do think the processes on funding is, is important. Uh, I also, uh, you know, want to point out and uh, not let this discussion pass without noting uh, that we actually got a proposal or a presentation from a local minority women-owned business about this topic uh, that you all reviewed and decided it wasn't the way to go. Um, it, that proposal didn't make, didn't um, survive the process, right? Uh, what we didn't do was shorten the process because it's very important for us to, as opposed to, as an example, we could say, instead of giving money to Salesforce, who presumably will pay sales tax in San Francisco, uh, we could do business with a local business that would pay sales tax here. Uh, we don't do that. We have a process. You all look at it, you examine it, you figure out what works, what's cheapest, uh, and what's best. And so I think um, just like that went through the process, I think uh, this ought to go through our, our financing process. Uh, I had another question that is uh, related to the moment that we're in now and that I think we're going to be in for a while uh, that may be, and Ted, if you tell me if this is this is mission drift or not. Uh, but, you know, during this process of PPP, you know, Mr. Blumenfeld pointed this out in the council meeting, um, the, the, the federal pay tax protection program, uh, if we had had quick availability for businesses in the city of Los Angeles to apply for that uh, funding, the city could have seen exponentially more resources in the pockets of Angelinos right away. 
Uh, instead, we were kind of hodgepodge uh, kind of doing it. Will uh, an outfit like Salesforce allow ITA to tailor things uh, and tailor this interface so that uh, program, federal programs like that might be accessed through it in addition to applying for city contracts? Yeah, absolutely. I, the short answer is yes. One of the reasons why we, you know, during our evaluation, the various systems and capabilities we were looking at, we wanted to make sure that we had a robust platform that could handle both interfaces with other existing platforms, as well as allow us the ability to configure and tailor. Now, not knowing the exact details of how exactly that would get implemented, that's always the it depends side of it. But the answer is this is a very robust platform that allows Babin to do much more than what we've known Babin to be able to accomplish. And that's exactly why we selected this platform. Got it. I, I appreciate that. I just think things like that are going to be as important as applying for contracts is going to be accessing the A that, you know, has come and that uh, will continue to, I think, continue to come over the next term. Uh, that concludes my comments, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Chair, if I may add one yes. more point yes. to that. Yes, I, please. I Thank you, Mr. Harris. Go ahead, Mr. Ross. I, I think the council member raises an extremely important point. Back in 2003, so if any of you are familiar, there's something called the Internet Wayback Machine, and it allows you to go online and see what a website looked like 15, 20 years ago. And if you did that for BAB and you see that back in 2003, it was this first very, you know, elementary, crude approach at all this. And over the last 17 years, because of how important a topic this is, Bobbin has grown, added additional capabilities and functions. And so I think Councilman Harris Dawson is raising the exact important point. Just because we've gotten up to this point doesn't mean this is the functionality that everyone needs. And going forward, there's new additional capabilities that have to be put into it. So we see this as not just an opportunity to replatform what has got us to this point, but we see this as something very new that allows us to take it much further. And, and, and I think these are all very valid points, and we want to be the best region in the country that not only publishes opportunities and allows you to digitally submit and compete for opportunities or to digitally certify, but expands into other capabilities as the city needs it and as our business community needs it. And so that's exactly what I believe the vision is. I know the chief procurement officer and IT is here to support that. And speaking, you don't really have to go way back, uh, but Mr. Blumenfeld, and I will remember just not uh, more than a few years ago working on uh, some of these issues where we were trying to do outreach to our local uh, businesses. And we didn't even have a comprehensive list of email addresses for the businesses that have business uh, gross receipts tax, uh, uh, business uh, licenses in uh, the city. So, um, We've, you know, made some progress, but God knows we still have a long way to go in institutionalizing the the process of being able to communicate, do outreach, uh, and, you know, uh, maximize inclusion for our small business community uh, here in LA. So um, it's a it's an important point, Mr. Harris Dawson. Thank you. Uh, okay. Any other comments on this? Mr. Chair, one, one last item, if you don't mind. Yeah. Yes, please, go ahead. I think one thing that was, that was both stated during public comments and is also something that we would like to reinforce, we believe the ease of use is a critical component of this system. And so we've been in conversations with the mayor's chief procurement officer and others to try to identify a focus group in the early stages that will help weigh in on some of the requirements, some of the pain points, et cetera, that we're truly building a system that is responsive to our customers and then also leverage that focus group as a part of the testing process. Uh, this should not be a, city, a system built by the city for the city. This is a system built by the city for the region. And so we want to make sure that we're very clear who our customers are and build it according to their needs. And that is one of the terrific strengths of this proposal. Um, this is a really rare opportunity to uh, spend less than a million dollars to potentially leverage billions of dollars of investment in events, in infrastructure, uh, in so many other uh, areas of procurement um, that should be coming to local businesses, but isn't. And um, 
I think our public speakers uh, summarized it very well. This has been a tremendous frustration that uh, since, uh, as long as I've been on the council, that so much of our procurement, the majority of our procurement, goes uh, to large businesses outside of the city of Los Angeles and not to our business community. Whereas Mr. Harris Dawson pointed out, they're going to be paying their taxes. They're going to be, uh, have a local payroll. And so the people on that local payroll are going to be par paying their taxes here. And that money stays in our economy and lifts up people in every neighborhood of Los Angeles when we can do this. And it's, it's, it's kind of shameful that, um, we have not made more progress in making that happen earlier, but now we have an opportunity that we have to seize. This um, Compete for LA uh, program and updating Bavin and uh, bringing this in-house so that the city of Los Angeles is the hub of Southern California uh, procurement, potentially, for these big events is a an extraordinary opportunity and I think will help uh, help us rapidly recover uh, from the economic uh, downturn that we've suffered and um, this is going to be one of the keys to lifting us up and out of uh, the situation that we're in and I think that in part because of this and because of the many events that we have coming up and notably the 2028 Olympics, but all of the other things that we have going, investment in transportation infrastructure under Measure M, all of the other things that the city, county, this region are investing in locally. Um, this gives us a, a real opportunity to outpace uh, the rest of the country in our recovery. And, um, and we just can't miss that opportunity. So, um, uh, I've done a little bit more digging, Mr. Blumenfield, as we've been uh, talking, and um, because I think your concern about the Innovation Fund is, is well taken, um, what I would like to suggest as an alternative for that amount uh, of money, the $168,000, is um, we can set aside, um, there is funding available to be loaned from the Public Works Trust Fund, as this is a, you know, issue directly related to the work of the Public Works Trust Fund. They can be loaned to pay for this and then repaid out of the proceeds that we'll be realizing uh, from the Compete for LA program. So it would be not an expenditure, but a loan. And that way we can not have to take uh, any money from the Innovation Fund if that makes sense well that that sounds that sounds great that makes a lot of sense um and as i said and it also makes sense for us to to try to recover fema money out of this I mean, yes that's absolutely that's a that's a given i think for all a hundred percent of the costs of this we should be pursuing the fema money but whether or not we can get that is an open right. question um but we should certainly instruct the cao to pursue uh reimbursement for every penny of this at least in the first year uh, when it is most directly applicable. Great. Office, you wanted to, to jump in. Go right ahead. Mr. Chair, um, it, it looks like we're getting word back from the budget director that if the IPC money has not been encumbered, um, it will be swept. However, they are reconsidering all the reappropriations, and if it doesn't meet public health and safety or other guidelines outlined in the mayor's budget tightening memo, then it would be swept. But I think that we can have further conversation before this item goes to council and then make necessary amendments if, if you deem appropriate. So I think, um, thank you for that. And uh, that just means that this, like everything else in our budget is in, you know, a significant amount of flux as we move forward through our June budget finance hearings to try to determine how we um, uh, will proceed. But I think given that, I still would like to proceed with um, increasing the loan from the Public Works Trust Fund, and that will be our default position uh, so that we won't have any further delay in considering funding sources. Just approve that now and uh, move forward and uh, um, not have 
uh, any more uncertainty over over whether or not we're we're proceeding. So that would be my suggestion if there's no objection. Agree. Second the motion or, or just agree with it. Okay. Um, I concur. All right. Very good. Um, so with that, we do have a number of amendments that are going to need to be read in. So I'd like to ask the CLA to go ahead and read those. Yes, Mr. Chair. Clay McCarter with the CLA's office. So just to clarify, these amendments will, will cover everything we've, we've been speaking about and adding a few others. First, we would recommend that the committee delete funding from the Innovation Performance Fund, amend recommendation number two to change the title of the fund from Innovation Performance Commission Fund so, to ITA LA Bavin, three, amend recommendation number two to change the account and title of the fund from Economic Development Trust Fund to account number 22S983, Economic Development Projects UDAG, Four, approve a public works trust fund loan in an amount not to exceed $579,000 for the L.A. Bavin replacement project with a repayment schedule of three years, subject to the approval of the Board of Public Works to be repaid either by L.A. Bavin user fees, direct appropriation from the general fund, or other identified sources. Five, authorize and appropriate the transfer of loan proceeds from the public works trust fund, number eight, Three four Department 50 to Information Technology Agency Fund number 132 account number 3040. Six, instruct the clerk to place on the earliest council meeting in fiscal year 2021 the following: instruct the controller to transfer $996,286 from FY 1920 fund number 100 Department 32 account 3040 contractual services. To FY 2021, fund number 100, Department 32, account 3040, contractual services. Number seven, authorize the CAO to make necessary technical changes to effectuate the intent of this report. And number eight, Mr. Chair, the CLA would recommend that we be included on the instruction to the CAO to look for any federal funding to reimburse the cost of this project. I absolutely agree with that. Um, one question. Uh, the you indicated we were, uh, we were deleting the innovation fund appropriation. Is it still necessary then to amend recommendation two to change the title of the fund? That is correct. No, it is not. Okay, so that will be that will not be among the amendments. That will not be. Yeah, we are deleting the funding. Yes. Right. So, so you don't need to do items uh, recommendations one or two, correct? Correct. So really we're just doing three through seven. And then we're adding an eighth to include the CLA in the COVID uh, federal reimbursement research. Yes. All right. Um, before we proceed with that, uh, just to, to close this out, um, I really want to thank, uh, first of all, the leaders of the business community uh, who are here today to speak and who've been working on this uh, so diligently uh, now for close to two years uh, that we've uh, that we've been putting forward and I think this is a this is a moment that we're going to look back on um, and really uh, value the work that has gone into this when we see the results that it's going to produce uh, over the coming decade in helping to lift us up out of this economic crisis create jobs create opportunities for more small businesses and, and more people throughout our city so I really want to thank all the business leaders a uh, special note uh, of thanks to Mary Leslie, uh, who is, uh, of course, a force of nature with LABC, who has is absolutely relentless uh, when she has a great idea, and she has many of them, uh, to make sure that those ideas become reality. So uh, I want to especially thank Mary and, and all of the city staff uh, that's worked on this to, to not only take that good idea, but figure out a way to make it uh, something that is even better and to bring it in-house so that um, we can um, accomplish even more uh, with this program. So I, I really want to thank, uh, of course, uh, Shannon and Ted and your staffs and uh, everybody else who's worked on this. But I do really want to make one particularly special uh, note of thanks uh, to Julia Gould, 
on my staff. And as Shannon noted earlier, um, Julia is going on to bigger and better things. Uh, she's been accepted into law school. I hope I'm not speaking out of school, Julia, by revealing that. But today is her last day on the job. And uh, this has been one of her big heavy lift projects that she would not leave here until it was done. And uh, so I'm especially proud that she's going on. She's going to have a terrific career as a lawyer and continue to contribute, I'm sure, many great things uh, in terms of policy and, and otherwise. She's been a stellar member of my staff, and I will miss her, but this is a great legacy for her to leave behind on her last day of work. So, Julia, thank you. And uh, uh, with that, um, I uh, will go ahead and let's go ahead and call the roll. Yes. Um, so, Mr. Chair, for this item, uh, the committee's action is to approve as amended. Um, so, Council Member Paul Krikorian. Aye. Council Member Bob Blumenthal. Aye. Council Member Marquise Harris Dawson. Yes. That's the I vote, sir. That measure passes as amended. Thank you all very much. Uh, terrific work. And that will bring us then to item number one. Item number one is the EWDD report relative to the department's business response unit. Uh, good morning, Council Members. Hope everyone's doing well. Uh, Daisy Hernandez here with the Economic and Workforce Development Department. Before good morning. You, good morning. Um, before you is a series of reports from EWDD requesting for you to note and file quarterly metrics reports for the business response unit. As part of the jobs plan, a centralized business response unit, or the BRU, was established to serve as the first point of contact to assist businesses through the city's processes, requirements, and resources. Uh, due to COVID-19, now more than ever, businesses in the city need help, and the BRU has been front and center in providing assistance. Now, the reports before you provide details about BRU activities from the inception of the program back in April 2018 through September 2019, including the number of businesses assisted, the average time it takes to resolve issues, and the trends in the types of problems for which businesses are seeking assistance. But at this time, I would like to take this opportunity actually to provide a more current verbal update on BRU activities. Uh, to date, the BRU has assisted approximately 730 businesses. Um, uh, this is from the inception of the program until now. Now, this includes an increased number of calls since the COVID crisis started. Since March, we have assisted over 150 businesses, and about 50% of those calls are COVID-related. Now, other calls were for questions regarding business tax registration, questions about starting a business, and questions about LA Babin. The average response time for our BRU calls is um, zero to three days, um, meaning that zero meaning that we resolve the issues or, or provide the assistance right away on the call. Now, EWDD proactively markets the BRU um, to make sure that business owners know where to go for help when they need it. Prior to COVID-19, BRU staff attended over 30 community events to promote the program. Um, that concludes my presentation. I will be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much. And I'm actually pleased to hear that you've had such an uptick uh, during the COVID-19 crisis because that is an indication that people are aware uh, that uh, the BRU exists and are that's that's part of the reason for having it in the first place. So um, I'm really glad to hear that you've been able to take care of the needs of so many businesses during this time. Uh, questions, members? Mr. Harris? I have no questions, Mr. Chair. Mr. Blumenfield? No, I don't. I mean, I, well, the number of calls you get per day is, is just, I'm just trying to look at the numbers. It's, it's about one or two, is that right? It's, um, yes, I, I would say an average. Yeah, sometimes we get more, sometimes we get less, but yes, I would say maybe two to three calls a day. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, and for now, we're going to note and file that report, but going forward, we're going to probably uh, count on having more frequent uh, reports uh, because there has been
quite a long delay, uh, unfortunately, in that. So that's no one's fault. But going forward, we, we will probably be having reports at least quarterly. All right, um, so we will, without objection, we'll go ahead and note and file the WDD reports, and that brings us to item number two. Item number two is a Municipal Facilities Committee report relative to expenditure guidelines for the Economic Development Trust Fund. Uh, Mr. Chair, would you like me to call the vote to note and file item one, since this is, a, this is an audio uh, meeting? Yes, I guess we need to do that. Thank you for the reminder. Uh, Council Member Paul Krikorian. Aye. Council Member Bob Blumenkiel. Aye. Council Member Marquise Harris Dawson. Yes. We have three eye votes. Sir. Item Thank is not compiled. Thank you. So that will bring us to item number two then. And is Mr. Hughes on the line? I am. Thank you. Good, Good afternoon. Good morning, Mr. Hughes. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I think it's appropriate to provide context for the need of the Economic Development Trust Fund. It's important to sort of reflect on the ordinance that established EWDD. Um, and so there is an ordinance that certainly created EWDD and transferred and consolidated the economic development powers and duties of the former community development department and other city departments. Um, but it also added a preserve provisions specifically to establish a procedure for conveyance of real property interests owned or controlled by the city for economic development purposes. And so the asset management framework uh, commissioned by, by this committee on jobs provides a procedure for conveyance of property for economic development and other uses, including housing and public facilities. And so the plan for the use of um, funds from the Economic Development Trust Fund um, will essentially further enable the department to fulfill its purpose of maintaining and creating sustainable economic development projects and programs. And the EDTF guidelines, in short, provide for gap financing, property acquisition, property enhancement, and economic development programs and projects. I think it's important um, as we sort of came up with those categories um, that we have that fourth one, namely economic development projects. And I'm going to speak to that in a moment. But just going back over the gap financing category, uh, more specifically, um, a project that requires EDTFs to, to fill a financial shortfall in the development pro forma as determined by EWD underwriting guidelines, um, monies can be injected into those deals essentially to assist with uh, debt service um, for any potential uh, project, typically retail, industrial, warehouse, office space, et cetera. Um, under the property acquisition project, or PAP, a project that requires EDTS funds to purchase private or other public property for the creation of economic development opportunities, and certainly um, property enhancement projects, or PEP, um, whereby funds can be utilized uh, for projects that require construction, renovation, or rehabilitation of properties. Um, but lastly, um, the other category is economic development projects. And this gives us a bit more latitude in terms of the types of projects to be funded because this category allows for funding of projects uh, for human service programs specific to job creation, technical assistance, professional services, or economic development programs and projects. And sort of in the spirit of, you know, item three that we were talking about earlier, um, it's worth noting that the department supports the need to upgrade uh, the city's procurement platform, and uh, not just in words, but um, through the EDTF, um, the department is able to provide a tangible support um, as a procurement enhancement tool that will essentially have a direct positive impact on the business community. And I, I think it's you know, no coincidence that we were talking about um, the procurement platform and upgrading Bavin. And here it is, we're talking about the EDTF, which in some ways um, can certainly help the backfill and pay for those types of projects and programs um, along with a host of others. And so um, the Economic Development Trust Fund, essentially 
the way in which it gets its money, the way in which it was envisioned by Jobs Committee, is through the net sales proceeds of properties that were intended for economic development. And that's clear. That's understandable. Um, many of the properties that have been sold um, have been either encumbered with other funds whereby nothing newer to the department or to the trust fund, or there were essentially double escrows in the case of uh, some of the former redevelopment agency properties, again, where there were net, no net sales proceeds that are newer to the city. Uh, but there are some deals that are sort of in the pipeline whereby um, the fund will be funded in the manner in which sort of originally contemplated. Um, but thankfully, um, the department has had some, some other dollars that have sort of been reappropriated to the trust fund to help us um, and help the city in its efforts to move forward with um, a variety of programs and projects, not the least of all, um, the one that uh, we just heard a moment ago. Uh, but that's essentially, hopefully that provides some background to the trust fund and where we are now, and I'm available to answer questions if you all have any. Well, thank you very much um, for that report. And I'd like to take one big step back from the trust fund itself and um, let's talk a little bit about utilization of city properties for economic development purposes. Um, for many years, it was a massive struggle even to identify the parcels that the city owned. And thankfully, we've gone very far towards uh, uh, achieving that task of at least knowing what it is that the city owns within the city's boundaries and outside the city's boundaries, for that matter. But um, each of us in our districts used to struggle to identify uh, even the property within our districts that the city owned. We've, we've gone very far in addressing some of the challenges in doing that, and they're uh, there are a lot of good reasons why that was more complicated than it sounds, and those uh, challenges have largely been overcome at this point. But now we have a situation where those parcels are, um, there's competition among very important policy objectives for utilization of those properties. Um, we have a need for more housing. We have a need for economic development in support of uh, businesses. We have a need for properties that can be used uh, for uh, shelter or other responses uh, to homelessness, uh, all sort of competing for the same city-owned properties. So strategically, how do we best identify what properties are best used for what purposes to, to maximize the best value, if you will, uh, for the use of those properties? Certainly. No, I can appreciate uh, the question, particularly in light of some of the policy, much of the policy direction, you know, that's, that, that the city is dealing with, particularly in terms of housing and um, properties that um, may have otherwise been ideal for, at least for some, ideal for something other than housing are desperately um, being transferred or sort of uh, making way for housing. And the thought is, or the suggestion is that, well, gosh, what happens you know, to, to, to the opportunity to bring about some, bring about places whereby business can come in, um, jobs can be created, and you have uh, something beyond just housing in a neighborhood, but definitely some economic development. I think where we are now, we have to reevaluate um, what's for us, even in the wake of the economic development project, um, particularly the direction in which business is going now. Some of the offices, for example, are finding that the new normal might very well be the new normal when they go forward and mean that they're going to um, reduce their, their requirement for space. Um, retailers are adjusting to what's happening, and some of them are realizing that um, they, too, um, don't need as much space as they thought they did. Um, and so that's the market forces, and much of that will ultimately drive what happens on the dirt that the city owns and even that private concerns have. And so um, certainly zoning will, will also impact that. But there are certain instances and, and um, whereby certain properties, uh, based on zoning, it is singularly um, suited best for economic development, i.e. warehousing and things of that sort. So in the instance wherein there are those opportunities, 
Um, I know there's a few council districts where we're doing some feasibility studies even now that are suited for economic development and really nothing but economic development, given what's impacting the, the property very nearby. And so those opportunities will continue to pursue. But I got to tell you, in light of um, what's happening right now and some of the um, some of the concerns from the larger uh, commercial community, commercial development community, and development community, there are definitely concerns about you know uh, getting too far ahead of the game because without getting into the weeds, the financing that's necessary to put the deals together, the assumptions that go into who's going to fill the space, all those things are sort of in flux right now, and they bring about a lot of different questions. So, but in the interest of the city, we have the benefit of owning many properties in fee. And um, while we can sort of mitigate some of the concerns based on how we underwrite and or dispose or sell the property, um, the bigger issue is still there. And so this is fluid, it's iterative, but uh, we'll continue to be as nimble as possible to try to address the concerns and take advantage of any opportunities that might present themselves, notwithstanding the, the concerns. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Harris Dawson, any questions on this item? Nope. Mr. Blumenfield? Um, no, just, just a question of scale. Uh, have, how many properties have gone into the Economic Development Trust Fund so far? Is there uh, a lot of funding there from these properties at the moment? Great question. No, there isn't. Um, we've received some net sales proceeds as a result of uh, lease payments, um, but that total was south of $100,000. Um, the bulk of what's been there was actually sort of reconstituted from a, a, a subordinate revolving loan fund that had sat dormant within the department for about uh, 10 years or so. So that's about two and a half million dollars that we were looking to sort of reprogram into the EDTF um, that, that is being utilized in part to advance um, other economic development opportunities, not the least of all the JEDI program. And that falls back into one of the four categories I mentioned earlier. Um, so even in that case, whereby we have some money in the EDTF, um, much of that was derived from means other than what was envisioned, which is the net sales proceeds of, of, of real property. So um, we'll see what happens in the next you know, year or so to really help uh, bankroll that trust fund. But right now, council member, um, it's been funded through means other than what was originally envisioned. Right, and, and why, why is that? The property's just not being sold? Is that... Oh, no, the properties that have been so there, there hasn't been any net sales proceeds that would inure to the EDTF. Um, monies that are near to, to the EDTF in an ideal situation is, is such that 50% of net sales proceeds from a property, let's say sold in CD3, 50% might go to the council office and 50% traditionally would go to the general fund. Um, now, if a property is sold for economic development purposes, the 50% that would go to the general fund now inures to the Economic Workforce Development Department, more specifically the EDTF. But all of that is predicated on there being net sales proceeds. So while we have sold, <coughs> we have sold properties and developments have resulted um, from those dispositions, uh, there have not been any net sales proceeds. And I gave earlier the example of um, some of the option properties where nothing would inure to us. There are other instances where we've disposed of property for economic development purposes of former housing assets. And in those instances, the development resulted in business and economic development, but the net sales proceeds reverted to the low-income housing trust fund. So, but for that, 50% uh, of those proceeds would have come to the EDTF. So as we continue to unload property <clears throat> and properties are not otherwise encumbered, then the appropriate amount would come to the EDTF. Okay. And the guidelines, they've been in place or since like 2016 or, or it's been a while, right? The, the, the guidelines, yeah, they were established right there. They were, they were put together quite some time ago and much of this, correct me if I'm wrong, CLA, is to have these guidelines formally blessed and adopted. Um, yeah, obviously, there were a couple things that happened. On the one hand, I think the policy went ahead and was blessed, and this trailer, which is the guidelines, um, is something that we want to have blessed, and it needs to go through this process. Is that correct, Clay? Yeah, this is Clay McCarter with the CLA. So these guidelines went to the Economic Development Committee, and they were approved in 2016, but the guidelines have never been approved by the full council. 
Um, the, the full council has adopted money for the EDTF and they adopted a, a ordinance creating the fund, but the guidelines have yet to be adopted. Okay, well, sounds good. I'm, I'm for it. That's it, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Boone. Um, so just, again, taking one step back, Mr. Hughes, uh, when it comes to one of the thoughts that we had years ago, I think even when uh, Mayor Garcetti was still on the council, he was one of the advocates for creating this economic development opportunity using uh, city-owned properties that were essentially surplus, if not formally surplus. Um, and the first step in that was, as I mentioned, identifying what those potential utilizable properties would be, and then essentially unleashing the power of the private sector to identify where there might be opportunities for investment that would create jobs and create opportunities in neighborhoods uh, using uh, city-owned property in one way or the other. And um, when it comes to affordable housing, when we identify sites, uh, we have a, a fairly robust evaluation process for identifying sites and evaluating them and then outreaching to the affordable housing development community uh, for those opportunities. I'm wondering if we have any sort of parallel process of specifically identifying and then doing outreach uh, to the private sector when it comes to uh, economic development and what that looks like. Sure. Um, the short is we, the, the process, um, certainly that housing has, is, is an admirable process, um, and there is significant money to, to finance uh, housing that's been you know, provided by the city and, and other means. In the case of economic development, um, our process is to assess property either as a result of a motion or to proactively go out and identify city-owned property, um, to, to make the, uh, conduct a feasibility study um, to make certain that there is a possibility um, for some type of use, particularly economic development use, that will benefit the community and the city specifically, um, and then market that opportunity vis-a-vis -vis requests for proposals. And there are a number of developers that have expressed interests and in properties uh, that the city owns, um, some of which only to find out that has been dedicated for housing, but there are other instances whereby we have a laundry list of developers, specifically of commercial development, um, that are interested in, in, in developing city-owned assets. Um, there has there's been several occasions. We just released an RFP, I think, here just a week and a half ago um, to the development community, roughly about an eight-acre site, um, likely to be a large mixed-use development. And there's been a lot of interest, um, even at the request for information stage. And now that we formally request uh, the request for proposal on the street, um, we anticipate there being a... Um, a pretty strong response. So, in short, we, we market it. There, are, there is demand, um, but we'll see, again, what the marketplace is like in the near term because of some of the changes that uh, the economy is going to be um, dealing with. Yeah. All right. Uh, very good. Any other uh, comments? Any questions, uh, other comments or questions from members? All right. We do have um, some amendments on this, which I, again, like to ask the CLA to read into the record, please. Certainly, Clay McCarter, CLA. We recommend that the committee adopt the report as amended to clarify that one, only projects on city owned properties will be forwarded to the Municipal Facilities Committee for review and approval. Two, instruct the CAO and EWDD with the assistance of the CLA to report with a detailed property review and evaluation process for economic development opportunity sites modeled after the affordable housing opportunity sites process. Three, instruct the CLA to report on the Economic Development Trust Fund guidelines and strategies for increasing the fund's revenue. Four, add assistance to small businesses under the eligible project, project categories. And five, require city council approval for all EDTF funding allocations. Very good. Uh, any questions or comments on any of the amendments? If not, we'll go ahead and call the roll. Um, Council Member Paul Krikorian? Aye. Council Member Bob Blumenfield? Blumenfield, aye. Council Member Marquis Harris Dawson? Yes. We got the aye, sir. Very good. 
Uh, is there any other business before the committee? The desk is clear, sir. All right, seeing none, and with, again, our great gratitude and best wishes to Julia Gould, we are adjourned. How do you shut this Recording stopped.